continue to hold. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, before I hand it off to, to George Jeffcock, um, just a reminder that if you have any questions along the way, um, please use the Q&A feature in the WebEx. If you're not seeing a Q&A box in the lower right of the screen, just go up to the, the upper right of the screen and hit the question mark icon and it will open for you. I am with that. George, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much. Good morning and good afternoon. Uh, I'm just getting used to WebEx. Where do I find the slides? Uh, up above the screen, there are tabs. You'll see Quick Start, Event Info, George Jeffcock screen, and CA Plex. Uh, you need to be in the WebEx, which I can't really see it in there, in your small little icon at the bottom. Hold on. Uh, I'm watching with you. Hold on. Keep going. <laughs> You've got a lot of stuff open. <laughs> um, it should, the, the, the WebEx should have opened a a WebEx screen, and obviously you're in it since you're sharing. Oh, there we go. Yeah, that's going to be pretty difficult switching in between. Yeah, it's not. Um, it's not always ideal when when you're doing a, a demo. Um, what you what, what you could do is is just open up the PowerPoint on your own on your I own will, screen I and then will. just and I then will. bounce that way. There we go. Okay, let's have a start. Uh, this is a some functionality that. Uh, I hope we all would like to see in Plex, and uh, I've worked in the last six months to try and get it to work, and I think it does work now. So let's get going. Uh, tiny bit about me, I'm uh, Plex since 1998, I'm based in Helsingborg, and actually I'm currently looking for some more work, so uh, give me a call. Uh, hey, 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 George, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I don't. I don't think you're sharing your screen anymore. Because all I'm seeing is the is the PowerPoint that I, that I uploaded into the WebEx. There you go. Now it's not, now it's sharing out again. There you go. All right, okay. you're, you're all set now. Okay. Sorry about that. I'm not used to WebEx. Uh, here's the title. Right. A bit about me. My name is George Jeffcock. Uh, I've worked with Flex for many years. I'm based in Helsingborg, Sweden and uh, I am currently looking for some work. Uh, I publish this all through Stellar Tools. It's all free. Uh, it's open source. I've done a few other things, and uh, there's links here. I know there's a lot to get through, 28 slides, so I'm going to rush through. Uh, so first things first is I would buy or download this amazing book. Uh, if you have read it, I doubt you need to see any more. So that was my joke. End of slides. Read it. It is amazing. And it's written by all the recognized experts. Right, background. Uh, from, I'm going to reference this amazing book by this. It's such a long title. Uh, at the moment, IBM I community need to modernize applications. And there is where else better to start from than the database. Uh, this was a nice debate it's on uh, by Mr. John Paris about we can actually go see it he's basically saying that there is two parts to it DDL and actually how you access so give all these links a read I've put them in the handout so that you can come back to it later it's a nice slide to say what does modernizing a database mean? You can have a look at those later or just look at them uh, another day. Right, here comes interesting stuff. The good news is we have modeled using Plex. Models being the word. Uh, I've spoke to a lot of people online and uh, Marinus, 
is uh, a keen player in the IBM space. So he owns his own firm that is modernizing. And he says it's a huge benefit that we have it in Plex because we have models. Databra, the famous modernizers, they have a nice article here about having it in 2E model is a great advantage. 2E Plex being very much similar. And in the, the famous book, there is this whole chapter on do no harm. When you try and modernize, they actually sometimes recommend you do no harm. Don't touch it, because if you set up referential integrity, it may fall down. But as Plex has been built, modeled with this in mind, and we built applications for SQL Server and Oracle and SAP, uh, SQL Anywhere, it, the no harm approach does not apply. Uh, I hope to show you today that everything is in the model, and there's no unsupported changes to runtime builds, and uh, all the Plex help are, is applicable. Uh, Plex developers already use this method, so it should be good enough for us IBMers. Next. Right. For all this to work, there was a famous bug in generating ODBC, and it was involved a comma. And you can, it's been fixed by CA, and I've, today we'll do the demo using Plex 7.1 and the fix. But you can use this with earlier versions. You just need to manually remove the comma. This will make sense a bit later. Right, one of the fallacies of modernizing the database and DDL, DDS, was it's for performance. Now, after my research, six months of research on it, I've concluded that performance should be seen as a bonus. And I'll leave these famous people to tell you why. Basically, it's not 2005 any longer. So the improvements that you could have got then are not present today. And so if you want to see the arguments and whys and do's and froms about the arguments, there's a nice uh, LinkedIn link here. We've discussed it and how I came to these conclusions. And even our own Chris Spinbate. Pragmatically, I found little benefit from performance perspective to moving from traditional RLA from RPG. That's mixing the two, ethos, the two ideas of access of data and how the data is defined. But all in all, I found performance to be a bonus. So don't think you'll just DDL your database and it'll fly along. It doesn't. It won't. It, it, it is caught up. DDS and DDL are caught up. Right. So if you read the wonderful book, basically it's asking us to stop program-centric programming and start data-centric programming. This is a fantastic recent PDF. And it goes through uh, loading, taking its time. It goes through basically these are the cuff, these are screenshots taken from the wonderful book, and it's advising us why we should move to data-centric approach. Basically, you're moving as much work down from the data uh, down from your programs into the database, which for years we have done as Plex developers. If you've been lucky enough to work on SQL Server and Oracle. Right, how are we to build DDL? Well, I pose the, the solution that we use the open database supported in Plex. It's, the trick is we are going to use the ODBC so that the table and view Plex objects are generated in DDL and built via the data source specified in the local systems database build options. Now, if there is a learning curve. If you haven't used this as a CPLEX CA Plex developer, you do need to learn how to write DDL because it's much more source-based. Uh, there's a nice help section in Plex Help. And as preparation, you could also go see CAPEX using database management system scripts. So the nice thing about using this solution and harnessing the existing solution of creating DDL is it's in help. Right. Some gen and build settings, uh, I have them all on so we get to see all the magic of doing data-centric 
programming. With the download of Stella Tools, uh, the build file supplied and uh, examples, so you can, you will always be, and I'm always online, so you can always send me a message how to set it up. Right, let's go to example one. I'm sorry if I've flown through this, but I wanted to get to here as early as possible. Right, when you look at the solutions on the web about how to reverse engineer your DDS to DDL, you'll find a lot on this API. And basically that's supplied by an IBM I. You pass it a DDS object or a DDL object, and it will spit out the DDL statements. So it, you can reverse engineer. And then you can use a command called run SQL system, and this will produce the object. So I'll harness them both in Plex. So let's have a go. Right. On the left of the screen is uh, Navigator showing the objects. At the very start, a journal, some tables, and some views. We're all familiar with that. Let's show at all these examples come from a silly little pattern, edit detail, surrogate, short description. We're all familiar with a little edit detail that adds records. Now, so that is adding records. Let's say we want to convert to that table to the DDL. Firstly, we must remove the logicals. Why? Because you can't build a table with logicals. There you go. Now, this is introducing a model API add-in. That was the right button click. We can go see it. And it's a little tool I've created that basically allows us not to fiddle around with a lot of source and, that it doesn't, and allows us to do automate this, really. And its job is to go find, it's going to build, so that's Jenna built the table. So that's using the sys catalog to see what it looks like and what it looks like in the model. So you can see actually we have a problem there. One's numeric and, and on the table, on the IBMI, it is a decimal. So it's, well, this world, well, this job, this model API is to help us move a DDS to DDL and keep it in the model. The second tab calls that same API. And that is what our table in Plex that it's found is converted to. So we could just run that. And if you now look at this table, type table. It's not a physical table any longer. So that is what people have been recommending is the straight reverse engineering. So I'm not going to touch any of the programs. I'm just going to build the logicals again. There they go. There won't be any data. Better copy in the data. Data copy back in. There you go. So I've never, that table now is D DDL. Logicals rebuilt, programs never changed. But here we come to my conclusion on this. Here are some advantages of DDL. That the audience advantages, only one member, but it gets by default reuse deleted records. But you can now do that on a, on a uh, change physical file. So my conclusion of the re-engineering is it's, but it's not in the CAPLEX model, which arguably misses the point of DDL support in 2015. A straight conversion does not equal constraints or no or foreign keys or check constraints. So 
yes, you converted it, but you haven't got the advantages that you may have got in 2005 of performance. So I think we need to go a step further. Now, in it, people's IBMs, they probably used view, uh, they probably created indexes, or if they're not, they should look at it, or EBIs, but they've not been in the model. I've been able to create it within the model. So when you use the, system, the index advisor and system navigator to say, advise me on what should have indexes, there's not enough data because it's brand new, you can get uh, an idea of what index you should set up. So I think we'll set up an index. The first one I'm going to set up is a primary key index. What has that done? Created an index there. It's implemented the same as a view. Oops, I'm new to Plex. Implement index name is the new triple. There you go. Built successfully via ODBC. Now that's in the model now. You can go look at the source. Create an index, and I haven't coded any of that. That is through the pattern. So it created a unique, unique index over the table with that name keyed on that field. So you have an index now in the model description with a larger logical page size as opposed to your standard page size. So if you want, you could delete your existing logicals for them to now piggyback is what IBM calls call it and use the same access path. There you go. Bingo. So it uses the larger access path. So we're still we're getting advantages, but importantly, it's in the model. So run it. Nothing's going to happen on this one because you're not changing the physical table. Now, let's have another example of encoded vector indexes. I'm not going to go through the pluses and minuses of using them because it's, tuning is a huge topic and I'd advise you to read these two PDFs. Go back to where we go. Let's add an encoded There we go. Now, this is the first time we've got this box up here. This is how we're going to implement several of these DDL objects, is by using scripting. By inheriting it, we've inherited a template for how to create the encoded uh, vector index. This is a great replacement marker that's allowed us to do this pattern. Here's a nice link to what an encoded vector index is. So basically, we will create the index, drop it, and create our encoded vector index. Right, flex, it needs an implementation name, like a logical view. There we go. Now, let's rekey it. It's selected. Close a bit of this down. Let's rekey it like that. 
by a short description and let's make it descending. Bit of cheating, cut and paste. Create the encoded vector index over this table, this field descending. There we go, it's built. Now it's in the model. If you view the source, you'll see this is what Plex generated for us, the default index. I've dropped that index and allowed us in the model to specify the code that we want, the DDL that we want generated. So it's in the model. If we go back and see the objects, what is that? There you go. The encoded vector index. So we can support that. We can when we change a table, we can see that these indexes exist. Because in my present client, we have these indexes and encoded vectors outside of the model. Three, the one you've probably been waiting for. This is to convert a DDS physical file to a SQL table within the model. So we're going to have constraints. And I'm going to show you the most complicated one so that we mix and match DDS and DDL. I don't believe you need to change your whole application. I think you should be changing it from now and choose sections. So I believe you're going to have a marriage of DDS and DDL. But in order to do that, there are two things that will bite you. And I'll go through them so that you marry. If you all DDL, you can ignore these two. So let's go through the same thing. We need to delete the logical, the files we will build this one, three. There we go. Select. Use our model API. There we go. It's found the table. It's found it in the model. You can see they're different. This is what we need to generate. Decimal, character 20, nulls, defaults. So it's very useful having this API because it shows us what we have to get to within the model. Now, this is the triples on our table. Let's add, let's make it a DDL table. Add and allow us to go through now because ODBC. This is the main screen. It's showing us the record format that we must equal for our functions to work, to be the same without having to rebuild. The record format must match. All these things must match. So if we gen and build it now, message log, gen and build. It failed. Why? Because a foreign key constraint. It's looking at table two via this foreign key, that one there, and it in the model is numeric. So we need to make the fields, if there's a DDS, if it refers to a DDS, we have to make it matching. So here is our first bit of field inheritance. Is a Decimal, nine long. Now when we build it, it will complain and say, not matching key. That is because it needs a constraint added to the table that we're referring to. So if I add there is constraint, now this is confusing. It's only when I wanted to show you how you marry both DDS and DDL. It's only these two steps. And this is going to add a constraint. Look at this. 
added. Primary key that we've just added, and that is the constraint. So now when we build, it's built it successfully. Now, normally when you, you won't have that headache, but I've shown it, shown it to you, and that's how you can solve it. Now you use it and see that they are differing. The record IDs don't match. The record lengths don't match. So now it's just going into the model and adding the inheritance. So it actually allowed us to do it by a little panel. That was saying nine long. I must be nine long decimal. Add that. Go back. Decimal. There you go. And so it's added it, added the default, it added not now. Let's add it to the chart because that seems to be an error. It's not the same. And there we go. The tables match. And it's in the model. That bit of inheritance made the ODUC, it inherited the right nulls and defaults and values and so that they match. So now if we look, we've got our table, three, we build the logicals. There they go. Copy the data. There we go. So the data's back in, works fine. New, four, four, four. Why is that? That is program-centric database. It's on, our t it's on our entity. It says, if it isn't, validate the check row. We remove that by check row, by physically calling it with a plugin. We rebuild that now we'll find that the constraint will stop us doing that. Build. So create a new record. New four. Four, four does not exist in uh, entity two. There you go. Little add-in shows me just the messages from the job log. There you go. It's violated the constraint. So you don't have to program and call check rows. You can do it by constraints. Now that is what IBM is suggesting. So there it is. It's in the model. You can build it as many times as you want. It's in the model. So we covered that one. Covered the field implementation names, uh, inheritance. I've gone through it very quickly. The model is there. It's all free for you to download to have a look. But basically, it is to make the fields match from what the IBM supplied re-engineering API says. Right, where is my source? We're taking a long time, so I'm just going to fly through this. Is the IBM I community is split on this. Should you keep your source? Should it be actually the database is the source? Uh, but I've created the source with my tool. So we just created this table via Flex, my add-in, so we can go see the source because I've used my add-in. Start with one. Sell our tools. I'm building them all here. QDBS. There we go. Check. There's the DDL. So when you have time, give that a read, but I cater for it. You can have the source via change management tools. Right. Column labels and especially long column names. A lot of people move to DDL because they want long names. Now to support this 
easier, it would be lovely if IBM supports rename column clause. And they do support it for their Windows Linux version, but not the DB2 IBM. But I have come round to a method of doing it, and I'm going to go show it to you. But let's keep in perspective the relative infrequency of file changes. You know, I think you only need to do this once. And then when you do change it, you need to change the script. So let's have a look at this table. Labels. Let's convert it. Same again, found the table. We'll want these, because that's what we want on our on our objects. Let's create it with aliases, so that's long name. ODBC, what's that? It's given us a new source object that we can enter in the DDL. Let's build it. So it's built. In this case, all the fields match, but we don't have any long names. So we can add long names by copying out and adding the column for clause ourselves. Copy that, copy that out, go in. And then go. Firstly, let's replace this. Replace that with it all commented in. I cheated there, sorry. Copy that. Replace me. There you go. And then you can put your my key. Four. And that is the clause. That's what it wants to give a lot to have a long name. Add another one. Has. Then let's get the object names. Copy. Copy, place it in there. Is that? Delete that. So the API helps us again. There we go. We've got the new long names. We've got the copied source of how to create the table after we've dropped it. Let's save it. Let's build it. Built successfully. Switch it on. Column names. Where is the old one? Did not. So it is supportable. And I believe that's not that bad when you're creating new tables. That's what you're creating. And we can create new add-ins just to do this replacement for us. But that's all we're building. So I think long names are supportable. Right. Let's build an entity that has no DDS. No DDS. There we go. Won't build because I didn't build the logicals. Dad, delete the logicals. So delete the logicals of five. Generate it. Delete. Found it and created the DDS. Convert it. So let's make this inherit from relation table no DDS. ODBC. 
Can I build? And they match. Now if you build the logicals. Ah, uh, not the logicals, the indexes. So we need to add the index name. There we go. I don't think we've done that previously, so they need to be built also. But there, the indexes. There we are. Two new indexes. Let's copy the data. Back in. No DDS, and it's all in the model. New. Six. So there we go. So that's, I'd say, is the options available for us to modernize. This was made possible by a clause that was added in 2006. So we could have done this since 2006. But basically, we need to match the record formats for views and with the indexes. I've Left this here so that you can see for for real what it you know how I how how you achieve this. I'm sorry I'm going so quickly. It's just we have to get through this. Now a word of warning. Famous people. Brigitte, she recommends that you can use an index in a plugin, whereas conversely in the, in the in the great book it says do not. So read up about it. As Plex developers with our trivial functions, insert, update, delete. We don't have much option. So at least Brigitte agrees with us. Here's some further reading uh, about journaling that you need for reference integrity. Uh, examples of what I've done before, Stellar Tools, automated test box, 19 entities is all DDL. Uh, what you do when you get to surrogate names, the ODBC generator uses the object name if no implementation name is found. This can give you a headache in DDS. Uh, you will need to drop the table and add surrogate names as a DDS script. But I only come across that really with the surrogate system. Again, quickly. Right, auto-generated columns are something for new development is what IBM suggests is good. It's like our surrogate system, but you're not going to a separate table to go get a next number. It is an attribute of the table. So new development, identity column. No trickery, it's an edit detail. It is my identity column pattern, and it's going to be all DDL, no DDS. Replaces the identity column pattern field with my own and has some values. That's it. That's it. Build it. Do you see all the objects? We'll come to this later, but there we go. Foreign key constraints. There's our new primary key index on our new table, I think. Yeah. Six. Refresh. There are our, our identity column example. Note, no logical views. All DDL. So let's do an example. One, one. How did it do that? It just got, it gets the next number available. It's in the data. We're making the database do the work. 
what they recommend, IBM recommends. Timestamps is another one they recommend. Let's just build it. And it's just given audit trail, insert times and update times for records. Here we go. I haven't done it as a column identity. I want to keep the example separate. There we go. New, two, 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 new, and then this gets it from the database. It's on the insert, not in program, but on the actual insert instruction. Let's change this one. Two. There we go. It's got an update time. So all for free, as it were. Right. We've done that. Right, the data centric program. I've done an entity that has everything I found triggers, store procedures, indexes, views, all in one example. Let's see how many objects we get. We build the whole thing. Cancel. We need to build the stored procedure first. There it is. Built. Stored procedure. Then build the rest. Store procedure, primary key constraint, two triggers, SQL view, a field level constraint, foreign key constraint, two indexes, three indexes. all from the model. So let's have a quick look in what they're doing. I have said that. Now these triples are all supported from ODBC SQL Server. So I'm not going to go through what they do. It's all in help. The leap was we can do this with the IBM I. That was the leap. So I'm not going to go through what this is happening here because it's in help. But basically, I've got a stored procedure here created. Here you go, stored procedure. It's an external stored procedure, calling it external function. call my function, and that's this function here. So that's created a store procedure with the parameters. And I've set up two triggers. The first trigger is when on insert, before insert, call this trigger, execute this trigger. It'll go, it'll check. If on insert, if my status is not equal to one, error out. So let's test that. Identical column, don't need to give that number. Status one, no. Let's give it status two. An error. There you go. State, that's the state message I gave. So trigger, so you can put your programming as SQLPL into the database. 
I didn't do that in a validate function RPG function. I'm making the database do the work for us. So actually, let's give it a value that it allows. It only allows one. And there it goes. It's inserted. So let's do, let's try another one. This is another great thing. SQL views. This is a grid loaded up by this SQL view. The SQL view has an embedded statement, SQL statement in it saying, select from these, select from the table, but only get new records which are status four. So give this, these links a read of why you should use views. They're very powerful. They can just simply be seen as uh, SQL statements in the model, static SQL statements. Any function, a native RLA function cannot use a view, SQL view. But I'm using a block fetch somewhere. Fetch. SQL view, there you go. And that's the pattern of the wiki. So it says, only load me up when records are equal four. So if we equal to step four, apply, there it is. Now that is being selection from the view. This block fetch is doing nothing but going to get the records. It's not doing any filtering. It's just doing a select columns and ordered by. The where clause is part of the SQL view object. So that they're very, very powerful. And you can join views together. Right. So we've done that. Let's see, let's try and create this in a state eight that doesn't exist. Another error happened. Why? Check constraint. So it failed. The check constraint only allow values of one, two, three, four. So I'm not coding this, I'm coding it in the database with constraints. Finally, let's delete this record. Apply. I have to remember what the rule was. If it's equal to three, call my stored procedure. Three, apply. Now, if I delete it, it allows it. What's happened is you have just deleted a record. Thank you for your attention today. How has it got that message? Is in my cool function that this stored procedure, this trigger calls my stored procedure after a successful delete. If it was status three, I want to do something. Call my stored procedure. This stored procedure called an external RPG function. And its, its only job was to write this message. You've just deleted a record. So hopefully that shows you them all put together. Constraints, store procedures, triggers, it's all available. It's, all, it's, it, it's debatable should you use them or not. That's up to you. But we cannot say that we cannot do it. It is possible. Very possible. But with that, now let's see how many objects there are to change management. Many, many more objects than what we were just used to. Maybe logicals and tables. But as um, Marinus says, the real challenge is how to manage all the DB2 components cohesively and, and integrated management environments. In a modern application, you end up with lots of Lego blocks. But my argument back to them would be, we do. We've now got it all in the model. We know what we're promoting. And then you just need to tell your change management tool or your in-house uh, process. Right. This webcast was for an hour and a half. We've done it. The proof in the pudding is usually not with these silly little examples. Let's try and do one of a real application. 
Now I'm going to choose, I swear, when I open this, I don't know what entities I'm going to do, but I'm that confident it's not going to fall over. It's what you classically shouldn't do. Let's open up my present clients with permission from him that we can open up and build a couple of the tables to show it in action. It's opening. If you have any problems, use the tracing in ODBC. When your build come up, when when it generates, you won't get it. But when you compile it, send it, you can use the ODBC tracing, which is very good. I had a problem today. Why the trigger wasn't building the second one? And I couldn't work out why. So I opened set up for the trace, which is somewhere down here. There you go. Creates trigger failed because it couldn't find stored procedure. That's why I created the stored procedure first because the second trigger wouldn't build without it. So the trace is invaluable. That's all. And it's opened. Let's go. Now, here's our entities. I literally have never chosen any of these. Speed test, no, I don't know what that is. No table. There's a the table, let's try it. Here we go. That's what it says in the model. Let's generate it. So build the DDS to our file. Decimal, decimal, well, we'll have an error there. Date, oh, it's a nice one, we can have it. Quite a lot there, decimal, a lot of work. Cool. That's what it should look like. So if we have any problems, we can go back to this and see what it needs to be. Let's just make it a table. Ah. I shouldn't have chosen that as an example. We need to move this to the end. Why? Because this has got a pattern here that as an implementation name on the physical table. So there it goes back. Now I've got a posting on supposing about that. Order of triples matters. So this actually does prove that I didn't choose one that would help me. But there we go. Generating build. Cool. It didn't even build. And why? Float. It's not even going. It's not even going to send it on that. So we definitely need work on that one. So that would be. Let's change date date char char decimal twelve. Let's make that decimal twelve. Generating boom. Decimal. Still more. Let's just go through them methodically. Let's add that to be a nine. See, it's adding it slowly but surely. Date. Let's make that a date. Generate. Slowly, char. Here we go. Date, insert. Default, default. Re-adding. I don't think we did add it. And we didn't. Time. We can't add it. It's in another model. I hope that will turn up. 
I can't change and add this uh, inheritance until going into another model. So this is an example where you'd log on to the Reshore standard model and change the inheritance of the field there. So I can't actually do that one, which is a shame. I'm not going to, I don't have time to log in. Let's try this one. I have done this one before. Here we go. Teach me to choose something that I've never chosen before. DDS, table, written boom. They all matched up because they inherited the triples from some, because some of this model has already been changed. We have, we are actively using it. So they've inherited the defaults and nulls for these fields already. So there was a quick example. I'm not going to brush over it. It was a bit disappointing. I chose by luck the one that I could, uh, i.e. you have to log into your library objects to add the inheritance. So, some conclusions of what we've seen today. I've gone as quickly as possible. Download it. The Stellar Tools, please download it. The Block Fetch SQL from the wiki is included. Uh, the cautionary tale was constraints have been around for years. We've been able to add constraints, as I did in example two, but no one used them. Now, we have to ask, answer, ask why, but if we don't do it now, I, I think we might even lose the platform. So we, we must modernize. That's what the, the, the great book keeps on telling us, really. Uh, you'll need to learn a bit of DB2 SQL procedural language. It's what I wrote the triggers in and the stored procedure calling the external RPG function. Uh, auto keys, remember, you don't use it every time. So uh, don't be a zealot just using Syracuse or just not using them. There's a nice argument here discussing which ones you should use or when you should use it. And secondly, lastly really, is to read this book again. It is very, very good. I think that ends it. I think we can go back to... Lem. Yes, sir. I think that finishes it for today. Oh, great. Any questions? Thank you very much, George. I went um, I it very seen. quickly. Go ahead. I went through it very quickly because I know people's time, but basically it's just to give a flavor, download the model. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much. I, I don't see any questions in the Q&A box at this point. Um, Guys, if you have any questions for George, please feel free to ask them there in the Q&A box. If we don't have any questions that come in now, maybe they'll come in later. Um, just so everyone's aware, we will be posting a replay of this session in the community later today. And you can feel free, oh, yeah. And then we can, uh, you can feel free to ask the questions in there. George is a very active user, so he'll, he'll definitely see them in there. And I, I also see an, another question just, just came in. Uh, about the PowerPoint. George, are you okay with me posting the PowerPoint in the community? Uh, yes, the PowerPoint is part of the download. Great. But yes, post it, please. Oh, okay, there, there is a question from Dean. When triggers or constraints cause an error, how do you return a meaningful error message when you don't know what caused the error? Yes, good, Dean, good question. Uh, when investigating this, this whole modernization and using triggers and using this technology, you code in a different way. Now, our patterns rely on an error status being returned, and therefore you know what error. Here you'd have to have a monitor message or something. But I don't believe that's a reason not to do, use this technology or to say maybe it's even more damaging when you say CAPLEX does not support DDL. We can say it does. Now, you can solve, do we, do I presently use loads of triggers? No. Have I wanted to use a trigger before? Yes. 
but I didn't think it was possible. So now with confidence I can say that yes, I support uh, encoded vectors, I if, in support indexes, I support triggers, I support stored procedures, and when I need to use them, I can. So it's a good question. When you code data centrically and not program centrically, like all the patterns are, you have to have a messaging method in between because the errors are written to the job log or are written somewhere else. So you need to have a monitor around the calls. But it's a different way of programming. I'd advise you to have a look on LinkedIn. There's a heated debate about architectures. Uh, and this is, it's the Plex people, our native RPG developers find it hard to move on maybe. And Dean's question is a correct one. You know, how does this layer tell, how does this tier tell calling a trigger, it doesn't even know it's being called, that there, there is an error? And you have to have in your calling tier methods to retrieve these errors. I hope that answered it. All right. I don't see any other questions coming in, so I guess maybe, maybe we should just wrap up then. I, I thank you very much, well, George. Thank you very I really much. appreciate it. Yeah, that, thank you very much. This is a great session. Well, I rushed it. It should have been an hour and a half. Uh, and uh, please, anyone contact me with how to implement this at their sites. And uh, yes, of course, I am looking for work, but uh, I did this for free. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, George. Have a great day.